Well, hope we get uh, well started up this week and we ready to come back. I'm used to things. My baby's all good luck. I'm in a baby. No, you're not. You're a handsome young man. You're a big boy. I have a baby. Well, all right. Let's dive into the book of Exodus. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. And thank you for this group you brought here to read your word. Um, whether we are here in person, whether they're here online, or whether they're going to listen in later. I pray you be with the word. I pray you be with our conversation. That it be glorifying to you and edifying to us. Be with us as we start this new book. May we learn more about you and more about ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Exodus. This is going to pick up not exactly where we left off, but in terms of interesting things that are happening in the world, right where we left off. And so remember that we had just talked about the famine is going on. Joseph moves his family just outside of Egypt to a town called Gosham, and that's where they stay. Um, and now we're going to kind of be reintroduced to that move in the first couple verses here. And then we are going to quickly fast forward about 400 years. And we'll get into uh, some things that are happening now and what a difference 400 years um, can make. So, Exodus chapter 1 verse 1 says this, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Okay, so... First of all, just a really quick note here. I've actually heard this quite a bit from people who think that the Bible um, is incorrect. They will read, these are the sons of Israel who came to Egypt, and guess whose name is not in that list? Joseph. So they say, well, the Bible's wrong. He had 12 sons. And I say, well, if you would just look down literally two verses, you would see that Joseph didn't need to travel to Egypt. He was already there. And so the entire group, um, descendants of Jacob at this time, was 70. 70 people. Big family. But we'll see what 400 years does to this family. And then verse 6 it says, Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful, and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So there's really not a whole lot of information on how many Egyptians there were in this time, but based upon the different cities that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob traveled to and the numbers we get from them, we're thinking that Egypt was probably around a million. By far the biggest city in the world in the known world at this point and, and at this and, and also remember that they're the only ones that knew the famine was coming so they're also by far the richest and they're bringing in a lot of people too because if, if you're not in Egypt then you're starving to death and so we're gonna fast forward 400 years and there's two passages that tell us how many people are in Israel now um, there's one in numbers chapter 1 verse 46 I believe and then another passage in another place. I meant to, to memorize it and I forgot. But it tells us that around this time for men over 20 years of age, so that's uh, basically if you're over 20 years of age you're going into the military. You're, 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 a, you're a fighting age. There were 603,000 men. So in 400 years they go from 70 people to six, 603,000 men you probably double that for the women, 
So that's 1.2 million, and then you add in all the kids. Most scholars think there were probably, at the time that we are entering this story, about 2 million Israelites. Is that what it says? Um, and that's in a city of 1 million Egyptians. So you can imagine the king is like, okay, there's something going on here. I feel that the, the people that are you know, they're not citizens of Egypt, they were just kind of given this plot of land by Pharaoh. and he, I can't even imagine uh, how much land 2 million people take, but I assume it's quite a bit. And so well, there's... Stop and think that. Oklahoma City is about a million or a quarter, so... Oh, really? I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even know. Um, so, yeah, you know, you got the, the size of Oklahoma City, but bigger. Um, that's well, just... Oklahoma City and Tulsa put together. I don't know. I did the math. It's not really fair, but um, because early on, of course, you know, they weren't having a ton of babies when there were 70 people all together. But once you get into the hundreds of thousands, you're going to have a lot. But over the, the time of 400 years, and I should have had Katie do this because she's good at math and I'm awful. Um, but I started with 2 million and I divided by 400 years and then I divided that by 365 days and I got that there was about 14 kids born every day for 400 years. Um, now, now, obviously, there weren't 14 kids born a day when there were 70 people. Um, so that pr number probably drastically increased you know, as we're approaching this time period, which is going to play a big role in what happens next. Verse 8, So now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So when it says that there was a king over Egypt who didn't know Joseph, obviously he didn't because Joseph died 400 years ago. Um, but the way that they kind of a, a split up time in the ancient world was uh, you kind of took the name of your dad if he was pharaoh or if he was king so you would have uh, Xerxes, you would have Artaxerxes, you would have Xerxes, the, you know kind of like we see in England where you have King Henry the one, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth um, but all of the same promises that that king would pass down to the son until there was a break in that family line and a new family took the throne and so what we saw was for 400 years, Israel was not, were not slaves in Egypt. They were given those promises, given by that Pharaoh who personally knew Joseph, and then that Pharaoh's line down until scholars see that there was a change in family right around this time. Now this Pharaoh that came up that was a part of a different family line, he didn't promise Joseph and his descendants anything. He says, look, we have to do something about this because there are people who almost double our numbers who are not us. They've been friendly. They haven't caused any problems. But he's like, if they decided to take us over, they could do it with a snap of the finger. We, we have to oppress them. We have to get them down. We, we, we can't let this keep happening. Let me ask you this question. You know, he says uh, that they might get out of the land. Could he have also knew about the prophecy that was given to uh, Jacob that they would be there for 400 years and he knew the time was... Yeah, Genesis chapter 15. Um, I, I, it's possible. It, it, it's possible, but that is a good point to bring up. A lot of people don't realize this, and we read it. Um, Genesis chapter 15, God said, you will, be, you will sojourn in a land and you will be servants of the land for 400 years. And of course, this was written a long time before this took place. And then here it is, the numbers line up exactly right. Um, and so they probably weren't surprised that they were in this situation. But um, they were really there and they were servants. But it was very cordial until this new Pharaoh steps up. And yeah, and it says escape from the land. And so um, it looks like what they mean is not that they weren't able to freely roam, but if they were to rise up against the king and then escape, I think is what he's saying here. 
um, you know, if they rise up and they fight against us, and then they could run away. You know, we can't, we can't do this. Um, we have to do something. So, in verse 11, he says, Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pythium, and Ramses. These store cities, it, it, it's amazing how rich Egypt was. I mean, we, we don't even know what that means in today's terms, but they literally had entire cities that was just used for storage for the crops that they had, for the money that they had. And they would have people that would live in those cities that would manage those things. Um, but it wasn't a, a thriving metropolis or anything. It was literally entire cities where there was just one industry where they would, this is the city that kept the grain. This was the city that, you know. And so Egypt was just immensely, immensely powerful. But Israel starts building a lot of stuff for them. It sounds like the coffee's done if you can buy one some. Um, but, verse 12 says, The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were, the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they're trying to like lower their spirits and, and, and keep them down. And they're just getting more and more and more, having more and more babies. I mean, they're just popping them out everywhere. And they're getting scared. Because, like, okay, we got a new pharaoh that doesn't like these guys. There's a lot more of these guys than us. See, it sounds like there's going to be a conflict coming, coming up. And that's one thing that I kind of wanted to, to talk about just a moment. You know, that, chain, that exchange of power um, from one side to the other. We're about to experience that um, in January from the Republican to the Democrat side. And, you know, you, you don't see anything in here about... Israel being combat combative against that. They're, they're very accepting of that. Now, things are about to get a lot tougher for them, and there's going to be a, the people that don't like them and evil that have the throne, but I do think that that sets a standard, and, and really, you know, how do you think as Christians we should handle a transition of power from one side that we may like to a side that we don't? Lots of prayer. Lots of prayer. Sure. Sure. Realizing that, that God is above all and, and trying to maintain that. And you know, you, you kind of get excited when somebody on your side has these plans and has these promises. Um, but then when there's that change of power, all that goes out the window. And there's an entire new agenda, an entire new establishment. And, and that can be kind of concerning um, for a lot of people. I know we live in Oklahoma, and, and there's been some promises made on the incoming administration that um, oil is, is not liking some of the things that they're, they're on board with. You know, my wife works in the oil industry, and, and, and so that's a concern. Um, but I think it starts to become on the sinful side whenever you... Um, I don't know. It gets kind of complicated, too, with the election and stuff. And I don't want to get into a big political deal. But um, if everything happens as it seems to be going, I think it would be a very good um, sentiment and, and look on the Christian people and what we would call conservatism um, if we're not outside chanting, not my president, and egging the White House and, and you know doing all these things that the other side so did um, whenever Trump came in. And so um, that when there's a change of power to recognize, like you said, God hasn't changed powers. Um, he's still there. He's in control of whoever's in the office. Um, and regardless, it might get harder for us. It might get easier for us. We don't know. Um, but regardless, just as Israel did, you know, we, we lick our wounds and we trust the Lord and we continue moving, knowing that He'll take care of us. But you know, in, uh, I think Proverbs he says, uh, King Solomon says he rises one up and puts one down. So he, you know, he's in charge of this deal. We just don't understand what's. Well, sure, sure, and you know. Um, I don't know that politics has ever been this divided before, um, but my hope and my prayer is that, you know, um, it's so divided that really not much gets done. But, but regardless, we'll, we'll move away from that. But I do think it's fairly, uh, I think it is fairly 
Are you drinking uh, coffee? Applicable. Okay. So, it says that they oppressed them and the Egyptians were in dread. So in verse 13 it says, So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And there's some archaeological evidence that shows um, Israelite tools and Israelite things that they were known to have and to make pottery and whatnot um, around some of the still existing pyramids in Egypt signifying that they probably had something to do with helping build those but you can also see if you're Egypt if you can suppress two million people double your population to be slaves for you I mean what can't you do you can get a lot done like that and that happened for a while we don't know exactly how long like I said, we're within the 400 years between um, the, the, wh wh where we're going to meet Moses, but um, there's still some years to go because they don't change until Moses grows up. And so verse 15 says, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was Shephra and the other Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on a birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. Why do you think the Pharaoh would make this decree? Raising up more fighting men? Sure. Men were, men, you know, every, every boy that's born, he just sees as another soldier. Just as someone that could, could you know, take over the throne. No, I never thought of it, but this is the first place you see a, a euthanation in the Bible, probably. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, actually, this is worse because they're waiting for them to be born because they didn't know if they were male or female, and then they were told to kill them. Um, and it does say, I don't want to get caught up too much on this, but, you know, this is the king of Egypt. This is Pharaoh. This isn't Pharaoh walking over to the Hebrew midwives and talking with him. This is him sending his intel, his servants, to talk to the leaders of the midwives. Because for two million people, um, you're not going to have two people that help birth babies, especially if we're doing what seems to be probably more than 14 kids a day. I don't know how tiresome it is for a midwife to help, you know, uh, help a woman birth a baby, but I imagine more than one is more than enough. And, and so uh, there's probably quite a few of these midwives, but these were what you would call the leaders of the midwives. And so he says, hey, you need to tell all your girls when they're, um, I can't think of the word, bringing the baby in. What's it called? Birth. Is it birthing? Birth. Birthing the babies? I don't know. There's a certain word I'm looking for, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> After you see if the baby is a boy or a girl, if it's a boy, Kill it. So, in My verse seven, the says that female children were allowed to live because they could marry into the Egyptian. That's a good point too. That you know, hey, you birth all the women you want, and we'll take them as our wives, and birth more Egyptians. So that makes sense too. That's probably a big part of it too. <clears throat> Um, verse 17, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? And let the male children live. <clears throat> and the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and they give birth before the midwives come. <laughs> like, well, you know, and, and, and so, you know, Pharaoh gives them this decree, and we don't know if they're lying or telling the truth. The Bible doesn't seem to really care, um, but it does say that they're like, we're not going to kill these babies. We're not going to do this. Um, but then Pharaoh is like, you know, Pharaoh sees a bunch of little boys running around. He's like, hmm, something's not right here. They shouldn't be running around. Why am I seeing all these little boys running around? And so he confronts them, and they say, there's nothing we can do. Uh, you, you know, the, the Egyptian women, they're more, I don't know, what would you call, um, flowery. And, and, and they take a long time, but these, 
Hebrew women just keep popping them out. They don't even need us. <laughs> and by the time we get there, you know, they're gone. It's already happened. And so that seems to get them away with it. Uh, and so verse 20, it says, God dealt well with the midwife. So that brings up another question, really one of, of morality, is if, in fact, what I, what I think this is, is the Hebrew women are lying to Pharaoh. Uh, otherwise, it, it wouldn't have said um, that their intentions behind it were because they feared the Lord and did, and did not do as the king commanded them, but let them live. Uh, then use that as an excuse. Um, do you find... Do you think there are situations where it is not a sin to lie? Let me ask you a question. You know, I'm reading out of the King James, and it came to pass because of the midwives for God that He made them houses. It looks like at that point, maybe this is where first hospitals were built. Yeah, I don't know. You know. You could draw that equation, but it don't say. I would I would argue though that that Hebrew word, um, where it says he made them houses, I think what that means is that he gave them families because the midwives they were single they didn't have, and so he blessed them with families of their own. Usually, you were a midwife if you were unable to bear children, um, and so the fact that you know they did this and they honored the Lord, what I think that means is he opened their womb and he gave them a husband and a family as a way of blessing them for serving him. Um, some of the translations will translate it families instead of houses, actually. But no, y'all didn't answer my question. Is it okay to lie? <laughs> Why do you think so? Well, if I, I mean, if I was in Germany and I had the guts to hide a Jew and Hitler came to my door and knocked on it and said, do you have any Jews? I'm going to say no, because in lying, I save the person's life. Most of the time, no, it's not okay to lie. But I think that there are situations that have to be very extreme, like life or death or someone is in danger. Like if there's, there's a wife who's abused and she's come to my house to find refuge and she's sitting, you know, in my bedroom and her husband comes to the door and says, where's my wife? I'm going to say, I don't know. I'm not going to say, oh, she's in my bedroom. You want to come, you know? <laughs> Yeah. 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 Like no. I'm gonna say I don't know. Check the neighbor. Like, and then I'm gonna call the police. That's great. <laughs> I think sometimes we can take laws like the Ten Commandments and be over literal, if that makes sense. Um, because also, if you look at the word um, "do not murder," well, in Hebrew, murder and kill are the same thing. Uh, you, you'll hear people say, uh, it's not thou shalt not kill, it's thou shalt not murder. Because murder has evil intent behind it or hate behind it. But that's really not the case. It just says, I mean, they use them, there, there's a few different variations, but it really means the same thing. And they use them interchangeably throughout the Old Testament. And so, that's where you get people like Seventh-day Adventists, who are very much literalists, that would say, no, you do not kill even in war even not in self-defense. If you do that, you are done. You're, you're out of the... Um, I'm not sure actually if they believe in a literal 144,000 people will be saved, but I, I do know that that might be unpardonable. And so, um, you know, I think you have to take into context the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to show you what sin is and to say, it's a lie whenever you lie for evil purposes. But you can also lie for good purposes. Katie brought some really good examples up. You can kill for good purposes, to defend your family, to defend your country. Man, if, if, if killing is a sin, then I don't know um, how I could reconcile God telling Israel to kill quite a bit. Um, and so I think we... But I think the problem is, especially with young minds, that line is very hard to establish, right? And so that's what I'm trying to struggle with too, is um, with, with lying or with stealing or, or, or jealousy. You know, that's a big one for little kids. I think it's a big one for all of us actually, but especially for little kids, wanting what somebody else has. 
Um, you know, I, I'm trying to, I guess, lean a little bit more literal for young kids. Even whenever it's like, if Katie were to go to, to Gigi or JD and say, hey, do I look pretty? You know, um, which you always do. <laughs> you always do. <laughs> But I don't, I don't know at this age, because I've noticed, you know, um, even even small things where I would let him have a snack in the car or something. I'll be like, "Don't tell your mom." <laughs> <laughs> that gets, for him, that gets a little confusing. You know, why why can't I why can't I tell mom what, what what's going on? And obviously, he's he's not very good at keeping secrets yet, either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I try to lean literal, but I think as you get older, you know, you, you at least need to be a little more open-minded to, to, to different things and, and not be so um, literal with that time. You want to know the truth about anything to say to a child. Yeah. They'll tell you the straight truth. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's very true. <clears throat> so, um, the midwife lied to Pharaoh. To uh, um, probably save themselves, but also to give an excuse it's like Pharaoh, there's no stopping this. Is basically what they're saying. Like we we can't stop these kids from being born. We're gonna have you're gonna have to figure something else out. So in verse twenty, it says God dealt well with midwives and. Uh, the people multiplied and grew very strong, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then God, and then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. And so, notice that he's not telling the midwives this, he's telling the Egyptians this. If you see a baby Hebrew boy, you throw him in the river. I mean, what a time to be alive, right? I cannot imagine that. Cannot imagine that. Yeah, we said, think we are in the evil times. That was the evil. And the unborn, uh, I mean, it's just an infant that couldn't defend himself and just take well, him. Well, I don't even want to think what that river looked like. Yeah. What an awful picture that must have been. It had to be, that river had to be poisoned with dead bodies. Is that any different than the abortion we have today? Well, you're going to go and bring that old thing up, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just thinking, go back to the midwife. Where I was born and raised, they still practice. There's a, my, I had an aunt that was a midwife. I was born, uh, that's all mother had in birthing her four children was a midwife came it was an aunt that lived across the creek and she delivered every kid on that whole creek through the years that she was alive she'd been dead for years but they still practice that in places too there's a lot of there's a lot of midwives out there that uh, mm -hmm. practice yeah yeah we had a, a family member that used a midwife for a, a home birth. I don't know how common that is to do home births, but I I get the idea of, of I think certain areas, certain religions. Yeah, it's, it's like areas. Mm -hmm. I think some of them Well my sister sister Grace, she was born at home under a little different circumstance. Yeah. <laughs> oh, on a, she's born and if you wish that would be her birthday. It was they was no den. And <coughs> I think Dr. Harris had to come to the house on a farmer's tractor to deliver her mm -hmm. instead of her being taken to Enid to give birth. Yeah. So. But I think you also, you know, looking at this situation, it would be very hard if Katie and I lived in this time period where we're slaves in Egypt to have babies. You know, to choose to bring a child into that world um, would be a difficult thing to do. You had to really trust um, 
that you know the Lord said that we are supposed to multiply, and the Lord said that that um, you know our our nation would grow, and I'm sure they had some casualties. But if everybody stopped having babies, which I think was kind of Pharaoh's goal, right? Um, well, they're not going to have any babies if we keep killing them all. Then uh, they would stop, and 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 then Egypt would never have had that issue, and, and Pharaoh would have never done what he did. And so, um, it's important that they kept having babies, even though they knew the consequences that may arise from that. And they were still faithful to, to that calling. But, of course, Pharaoh, he, he moves on. He's all right, midwives, if you aren't going to kill them, then my people, everybody, um, kill these baby boys. And so, um, you know, we'll get into the, the birth of Moses here, but... Uh, any uh, any thoughts or questions on that first introductory passage? Or how many Israelite boys died because of that? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Because mm. you, I can imagine that. Because it says the uh, what verse is it? I don't want to misquote. Um, uh, somewhere it says that the people of Egypt feared them. So this was something that they probably wanted. To, I mean, this wasn't like something they reluctantly did, but they did it because they felt a necessary need to kill these boys um, because their fear of, of being overrun. I think part of uh, Ryan's question will be answered later on when you know Moses kills some Egyptians for... Yeah, that's a pretty interesting connection point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So... There had to be some to get through for this one Israelite boy say, are you going to do the same? Mm -hmm. Yeah, then you have the boys of the Egyptians dying. Uh, it's verse 12 that says, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. And so, um, probably a lot. Yeah. Probably a lot. Um, but we know that there were more making it through um, than were not because they were still growing in number. Um, but a lot, a lot of sacrifices there. Any other thoughts? All right. Let's move on to chapter 2. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. Any thoughts on what a fine child is? A healthy child. <laughs> healthy. Male. Male. You can imagine, again, I don't want to put too much of my own thoughts into the verse, but I can imagine a mom uh, birthing a boy and being like, Oh no. So she, she gives birth, she finds out he's a boy, a healthy boy, and so she hid him for three months. Um, man, I don't know, again, at what point as a mother you bring that child, I mean, I'm guessing that the kids that did make it, they probably didn't see the light of day for years. They were locked in the house and, and weren't able to get out until, you know, they were too old to be killed. I don't know what Egyptians would consider not no longer a boy, but you can imagine most of their childhoods was probably spent um, inside. So it's just a really sad thing, but she finds out that she's had a boy and hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes. Or, or, uh, it says pap, pap, papyrus reeds. I'll be honest with you, I don't even know what papyrus is. I know you make paper out of it, but is it a tree? Okay. So what would a what would a papyrus reed be? Hmm. But um, it says that she makes a basket out of whatever that is, and daubed it. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me, with. Bitumen, which is kind of a, a that would probably what makes it, you know, because if it was made of, of papyrus, it's probably thin. But bitumen is kind of a, a oh my gosh, 
Tar. My Bible says tar and pitch. Is what? Yeah. yeah pitch. Pitch. I'll, I'll say one thing about pitch. That had to be dried out, or that baby would have been scalded. <laughs> oh, you think? Well, that's something that, and I didn't know this, but you know, in the Middle East, there's just um, pitch holes and, and pits of tar, tar pits everywhere. Yeah. And so you really had to watch out for those if you were in the middle of a battle because if you stepped in one, you were stuck. Yeah. I, I've worked with pitch and roofing because we put some pitch roofs on. Your skin would just be like you was scalded with water. Really? With that stuff. Just dries you out? Well, no, it kind of burns your skin. It's hot. Yeah. Blisters. <laughs> It's, it comes out coal mines around here. The fish that I work with. Yeah. Come in 55 gallon barrels and you have to dip it over in the kill. Wait. So, anyway, um, she put the child in this basket and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. So, I mean, it says she could hide him no longer. Most likely what was happening is uh, what scholars think is that the Pharaoh was probably infiltrating houses at this point. Um, he probably knows that they're hiding him, and so um, he's, he's going through. And I can imagine, you know, the guards being at the house next door, and she's like, I have to do something, right? Um, she couldn't hide any longer or he was going to get caught and he was going to be killed. And, um, you know, I, I think you just can put your kid in a basket, put him in the river and, and let him go. It seems a little bit yeah. radical, but I don't know what other option but you really have. That, that basket probably had to be built three months before he was ever put in the river. Or yeah. Well, it says she took a basket made of it, so she probably didn't make it. Um, she probably had it and maybe bought it. I don't know. But um, she she put him in the midst of the weeds, and, and then you can imagine it just says um, she stood at a distance, or his sister. So that's uh, Moses' older sister, you know. And, and of course, this, this mother, I imagine, is not going to be able to watch her child, her baby child, um, you know, three months old, float down a river. Um, but she she tells his older sister, hey, watch and see what happens. And, and what's happening is, you know, she did this in a place where the, there was a lot of grass coming out from the river. Yeah. And so he was somewhat camouflaged. Yeah. Plus um, that basket probably stayed pretty much in place too. Yeah. Um, and, and to be honest, I don't know if she was planning on, I mean, that is where people bathe. But then again, if there's a lot of dead bodies in there i don't know if people are bathing in there of course you know they wouldn't get plugged up it was a very big river that would move on down the way so i assume it probably stayed fairly clean um but i, I can't imagine you know if you're a nation miles down the road that don't not sure what's going on and then you just see bodies float anyway um but i guess her hope was look even if he ends up leaving uh egypt um, he's got a better chance than what's about to happen to him. And so um, his sister stood at a distance to, knew, to know what would be done to him. Verse 5, Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at a river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. So you're right, Charlie. He probably didn't move all that much. Um, probably stayed fairly still. She probably sat in there and walked away. But Pharaoh's daughter comes down to take a bath and she sees a basket in, in the river. So she sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby was crying because of course he was. <laughs> I would be crying as a fully grown man if someone put me in a basket and sent me down a river. We miss 
quite a few meals and sure. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really talk about how long he was there. Yeah. I, I wouldn't think it'd be too long, but no, longer than it needed to be. So he wouldn't. He wasn't old enough to crawl out or get out of the basket. Mm -hmm. or he mm -hmm. Well, it said his sister's been and watched him. So it was probably within the, at least the time span of the the uh, attention span of a teenager. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when she opened it, she saw a baby. It was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews children. Remember that uh, the Egyptians and the Hebrews, they looked different. Um, there, was, there was distinctives about them. So you could tell even a baby um, what it was. Plus, if there is a baby floating down the river, uh, probably good chance of who it is based upon the edict that's been brought out. But she took pity on Moses. Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. And Moses... Um, is the Hebrew word for draw out. So let's kind of review what happens there. Um, she, she finds Moses laying in the reed. She sends the servant girl to retrieve him. She find, falls, took pity on him, um, recognizes that he shouldn't be alive. He should be killed according to her dad's rules, right? Um, and then uh, Moses' sister sees what ha is happening. And so, and then it says, his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Um, because remember, uh, Egyptians and Hebrews or uh, Israelites, um, they didn't even eat together. And so if an Egyptian woman was caught nursing a Hebrew baby, there's no telling what would happen to them. That was not allowed. And so, you know, of course, you can probably think Moses' sister, too, sees this go to, oh, that's headed straight for Pharaoh's house. There's Pharaoh's daughter. He's not going to last much longer. Um, and so, uh, so Pharaoh's daughter accepts that. And so she went and called the child's mother, and she was able to, to nurse him for a while, and then eventually went into the household of Pharaoh himself right and so and he's raised as an Egyptian now we don't get a whole lot of into she could tell who he was maybe as he got older if you put certain garb on him or if you dress him up a certain way maybe Pharaoh couldn't tell but uh, how ironic that Pharaoh's edict would lead to a baby Hebrew boy growing up in his own home especially to free the children of Israel well he didn't know that certainly <laughs> yeah um, but, you know, you, you look at this and you find at least a, a little bit of relief, I suppose, that not everybody in Egypt was on board with this. And one person that happened to be against it was the daughter of the king. Um, you know, you want to talk about bravery. I, I couldn't imagine being in that situation. Um, you know, God has a way of making a way where there seems to be no way. Mm -hmm. Like Moses, you know, you would think that he would be put to death, but God chose Pharaoh's house. I think he knew that later on, when Moses started to take the children out, that he was kind of thumbing Pharaoh in the nose. Yeah, no, certainly. He's like, I'm going to use the least likely person that could possibly ever do this to lead my people out of Egypt. Um, and oh, and by the way, you're going to take care of him. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> you're going to be his grandpa. <laughs> And so, just a really, a really neat story there. Uh, we'll get into to verse eleven and, and what Moses does once he's grown up a little bit next week. But any final thoughts before we close? You know, you can see God's plan through every verse. Of this. God's plan. He had this all planned out long before Moses was ever born. Yeah. You know, and uh, he, he got the people to where they would, he knew what they would do and what they would say and how they would act and this and this and this. He knew exactly what was going on and that was his, that was his big plan all through Scripture. Yeah. You don't stop here, you know, his plan goes to the end. And even today it's still going. Absolutely, you know, it's just a, I think that's one of the hardest parts, too, about trying to understand God is how differently He thinks than us. And how He will purposely use people and things that we would never in a million years think about. Um, and even with our own lives, things that He'll use us for, uh, things that He'll He'll use people in our lives to do for us, that we were just like, that has to be God, because there's no way that would happen you know, naturally. I couldn't, uh, when I was in high school and you told me that I was going to be a pastor speaking on a stage, I would have told you, fat chance. <laughs> Not in a million years would that happen. That's like me saying in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my plan. <laughs> <laughs> God forsaken country for me, you know, coming out of the mountains and I wanted to get back to the mountains where it was cool. There was a lot of water and there was a lot of trees and I mean and here you can see the Indians coming for a hundred miles. <laughs> but thank God, you know, he he was directing my life, and he always has. And I'm so thankful today that I have, you know, been willing to, I wasn't willing because he, it was his plan for me, you know, yeah. to settle here and marry the one I did and to do what I did. And here I am almost 85 years later that, uh, Still trying to get back from the mountain. So. No, it's nothing. <laughs> it sure is nothing that I've done. It's all what God has done. And I'd speak to, you know, boy, I can't imagine where I'd be if God let me make my own life decisions when I was 18. But I definitely wouldn't be here. And that's not a negative thing. Um, I was a punk kid who had uh, way too much arrogance about me. And so, uh, you know, the Lord, even, even some things that end up not working out that we really want to do, you know, um, hopefully we come to a place in, in our lives where we learn why that didn't work out, you know, because the Lord's using it for a specific reason. There's a lot of things we go through life that we'll never understand. But there's a lot of things in life that God shows us it gives us the understanding. Amen. Okay. Sounds like at least one of my kids is ready for bed. <laughs> we'll pray and get out of here. Father, again, I thank you so much for this group that you brought here this evening to read your word. And I pray that as your word has gone out, um, that we would just take that to heart, that that truth would minister to our souls and our spirits and um, that we would grow closer to you and grow closer to one another as we just do our best to make you happy with our lives. So I pray you be with these people as they leave this place. You be with them as they travel home. You be with them as they go about their week. And that um, you would give them their daily bread and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all who joined online. You didn't hear when I was announcing this, but we're going to go ahead and do this every week.
And so whether you're watching with us live or whether you're going to jump on a little bit later, um, I'll be kind of monitoring the comments and stuff. So if you have any questions or any comments, I'd love to hear them. God bless.